For those of you who don't know Next American City, for the past three years, I've worked with this organization based here in Philadelphia. Uh, what Next American City does is we report on urban policy issues in cities around the country. So we cover things like charter school reform in New Orleans, or the arts economy in Chicago, or um, urban planning in Detroit, and try to spread the best practices throughout the country. And one of the things that I noticed, um, the cool part of my job is that I was able to go to many of these different cities and talk with emerging leaders there. And one of the cool things that I found out is that many of these cities are struggling with the same problem, which is figuring out how to create vibrant cities in the face of car culture. And cities are responding to this challenge in a variety of innovative ways. Um, we see in Denver that the city and suburban counties have partnered together to create an amazing light rail line, which is supported in part by a sales tax that people actually voted to pay for. Um, and it's changed the suburban sprawl model of that area into one of transportation-oriented development. In Washington, D.C., we've seen how that city, uh, which has the second busiest metro system, uh, found that its buses were sort of underperforming, and as a result, rebranded the bus system, called some of them the circulator, uh, did something very cool, which is put a map of where the bus actually is going to on the side of the bus, and partnered with the web community to develop apps um, like some of the ones that we have here in Philadelphia that tell you when the bus is coming, encouraging public transit. Uh, New York City has added more than 200 miles of bike lanes, and it's also done a lot to, to prioritize the pedestrian. So this is an example in Times Square where a swath of traffic lanes were covered with a pedestrian plaza, and um, it's given people a place to relax, uh, sit, hang out, what have you, and it's really changed the dynamic of that area from being a car-dominated one to a people-dominated one. And there have been a lot of really fun creative solutions that cities are employing also. So this is also in New York, a program called Summer Streets, where for a couple of days, a couple of streets in Park Avenue were taken over by swimming pools. Uh, here's another program in Cleveland where the Urban Design Collaborative there uh, took over a parking structure, the top part of a parking structure, and turned it into an arts and events space for a day. But one of the things that gets me most excited about the ways that cities are changing um, is that they're responding to urban highways. And so many of our um, cities have essentially been destroyed, separated, um, broken by a lot of these different highways, and cities are finding ways to knit back communities together. This is a rendering of a project that's actually under construction in, of all places, Dallas, one of the cities that is, you know, has a really strong car culture. And it's a five-acre park that's being built over a freeway that runs through the center of the city and separates sort of the downtown and the arts district from each other. And it's going to be programmed with music venues, restaurants, dog parks, kid zones, you name it. And the park is essentially being called the city's front lawn, a space where um, anyone can hang out. And while Dallas might be doing that for sort of um, cultural or amenity reasons, in New Haven, it's also sort of a social justice issue, where um, the city is essentially removing part of its highway um, and replacing it with a boulevard so that Yale Medical School and the downtown are better connected. One of the projects that got me most excited and, and got me thinking about Philadelphia, which I'll get to, is a project in Providence, Rhode Island. And if any of you have been to Providence recently, you've seen how the city has really um, been revitalized over the past couple of decades. The city actually at one point had um, concrete and asphalt on its river, and that was um, removed, and they've really um, changed the, the whole river area into a section called, or a, a program called River Walk. If anyone has been to the river, f uh, the water fire project, you see, yeah, it's kind of like this interesting combo of something that's very cheesy and very poignant at the same time, and it's very primal water fire moment. It's great. Um, well, the, the downtown became this, uh, such an amenity or such a, such a strong focal point for the, for the Providence region that they realized that having a highway in the downtown was a massive waste of space. And so they actually removed 195 from the city and moved it um, to sort of the 
over here, created a new bridge. Um, so the section of the, of the area that is in brown um, is an part, parcels that are being turned into um, economic development zones, and the green areas are going to be public parks. But the other thing that's really cool is the way that the city uh, didn't just remove the highway and turn these zones into, let's say, um, development zones for, let's say, a boutique hotel. Actually, in the shadow of the highway, a lot of uh, communities had taken residence because of the cheap rent there. So the tech community, for example, happened to um, kind of aggregate in the area near the highway. And so the, the parts of the highway that are being removed are going to be turned into an economic opportunity zone for the tech and new media scene. Um, which is a really great way of honoring the people who have been um, in that neighborhood for a long time and, and sort of creating a place for policy. This is going on around the country. It's not just an East Coast phenomenon. It's happening on the East Coast, West Coast, Oklahoma City, New Orleans. A lot of these cities are really trying to figure out what to do with their urban highways. And they're doing it partly because they are realizing that it's no longer environmentally sustainable to have so many people driving. It's, it's not environmentally sustainable from the standpoint of producing tons of emissions, but it's also creating a tremendous amount of infrastructure that isn't sustainable for a city. Um, Glenn Abrams is going to talk from the water department about stormwater runoff, and this is just a little infographic that shows you how much runoff is created by the fact that we have so many non-porous surfaces. Another huge issue for cities right now is trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to jumpstart our economies again? And cars are a huge drain on people's finances. Uh, this graphic shows that the average car owner spends about $8,000 a year on their car. Most of that money doesn't go to the local economy. So if we were able to take 15,000 cars off the road, we would be able to contribute about $127 million back to the local economy, which would be huge given the fact that so many of our city services are being reduced right now because we can't afford to pay for them because there's just not enough money coming into the city. And it's an especially crucial issue in a place like Philadelphia, where half of our population um, live in households where the annual income is $35,000 or less per year, um, where a quarter of our population lives in poverty, and where a third of our citizens don't have access to cars in the first place. So lastly, the reason why many of these cities are deciding to take down their highways or replace them or um, essentially deck over them is because they've seen the successes that many other cities have had in projects like this. Um, this is a, a photograph from San Francisco where the Embarcadero Highway uh, freeway used to be. And in 1989, an earthquake compromised the highway and the city decided rather than uh, rebuild it, actually, it was going to build palm trees, um, or not palm trees really, but they ended up creating streetcar, a streetcar line and um, a boulevard and essentially a multimodal space for the city. And it's been a huge boon to the neighboring areas. The property values have gone up by 300%. Um, a lot of the San Francisco economic development uh, team believes that it's really helped to contribute to tourism, and 7,000 7, housing units have been built um, since that period of time in the, in the area. Also in New York, in the 1970s, part of the city's elevated highway, which also separated the city from its waterfront, um, had, had collapsed, and, and 10 years later, the city decided actually it wasn't going to rebuild it as an elevated highway, but instead a boulevard. And so uh, instead of having that highway that totally separates the city from its waterfront, now there is a um, pedestrian accessible um, six lane boulevard that people can go across and actually access the Hudson River as well as an amazing park um, which serves as a greenway all the way on the, on the west side of Manhattan. So all of this got me thinking about Philadelphia and uh, as you can see from this photograph, the city, and you, as you all know, the city is bounded by eight lanes of highway, which is bounded by six lanes of boulevard, and all of that is separating um, the city from its waterfront. 
And I kind of despaired thinking about the situation until I found out one interesting fact, which is that all 51 miles of I-95 in Philadelphia are in the process or are in phased phases of structural obsolescence. So as you may have known, Gerard Avenue, um, the Gerard Avenue Exchange has been um, in, under design and construction for a period of time now. And um, that's one of the first sections of I-95 that's going to essentially be redesigned. And um, there's a bunch of different sections and different phases in which um, all that is going to happen. And I started to wonder about what will happen with three miles of I-95 between the Ben Franklin Bridge and the Walt Whitman Bridge. These three miles, which happen to be um, in the very heart of our city. And, and, and I was thinking about this, especially at a moment when I really feel like Philadelphia is changing. Um, Inga Saffron mentioned that we have added 8,500 people to the city over the past decade, but that doesn't really tell the true story. And, and I think that one of the things that's important to note is that the city's population bottomed out in 2006, but it's really come roaring back over the past five years, and we've been adding 8,000 people a year since. And in the past decade, actually, where a lot of the growth has been concentrated is in these um, zip codes where um, which are very close to those three miles of I-95. Um, the section which is in the deepest blue is the areas that have um, had increases of population of 20% or more over the, over the past decade. Um, so I started to think, you know, about what would happen to those three miles of I-95. And if we recognize that in the coming years, we're going to um, be certain that they are going to be taken down, and the plan actually for those um, miles of I-95 is essentially to rebuild the same elevated highway, why would we do that? Have we learned nothing really from, the pa from our mistakes from the past? Have we learned nothing about the current state of the city? Do we have no ideas of where the city is going in the future? And um, this made me think about this particular city, which I apologize, this is terribly pixelated, but can anyone guess where that is? <laughs> it's not South Philly, but um, it's Bilbao, um, which has been one of the most remarkable stories of urban transformation over the past couple of um, years. And um, Bilbao had suffered a loss of population of about 15%. Um, over the, in the 80s and 90s, and more than 20% of its population was um, unemployed. And essentially, many of the actors in the city got together and said that we need to do something on an economic development level to change this scenario. And so while we all know about Bilbao because of its fancy museum, there's a lot of other work that has been done to essentially change that city, including massive new transportation ideas, um, new jobs programs, industry, and so on. And so um, I know that TED is supposed to be about these big, powerful ideas, and I want to put an idea out there, which is that when we come to the point of uh, determining what to do about I-95, and when we have to take it down because it's structurally obsolete, that we not rebuild it. And that instead, by 2026, 20 years after the city has bottomed out, and presuming that we've added 150,000 people to the city if we're on pace to continue to attract people the way that we have been, that instead of sort of going back to the past in which we had before, instead we do something which is quintessentially Philly, that we do something that really reflects the direction that the country is going in, that we bring the kind of industry to the city that we have seen at the Navy Yard, that we bring schools to the area instead, that we build houses in the footprint of the highway and other green buildings, and that we reclaim our public spaces, the waterfront, and create green space for everyone in the city. And that in 2026, when we're honoring the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, we can say that we're creating a city that will last for another 250 years. So thank you.